giving me this chance so that I can bring the message for you this Sabbath morning. Yeah. I would also like to thank God for uh, giving me this chance. Hopefully, I may be able to present to you something that you all may be blessed uh, at the end of the service. Uh, before we start, shall we bow our heads in prayer? Blessed loving Father, we thank you for this Sabbath day. We thank you for this opportunity uh, to spend some time uh, diving in your scriptures. Uh, we believe that uh, you have a message for us. Pray that thou would give us receptive hearts and receptive minds. Touch my lips as I bring the message to your children. Father, thank you in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. The great composer Beethoven, you all must have all heard about Ludwig van Beethoven, not the dog Beethoven, the children might know the story about the dog Beethoven, but I'm talking about the famous music composer Ludwig van Beethoven. I'm sure most of us must have heard his music. Uh, he's one of the uh, most famous music composers, so we have grown up listening to his music. Even budding musicians, as they try to learn new pieces of music, the one of the first uh, pieces that they all want to learn to play is for release. You might know the piece for release and. Uh, there are so many other music pieces that uh, he had written, uh, but you know, apparently, Beethoven suffered from acute hearing loss in his late 20s. He became 60% deaf in both years, and by the age of 30, he went completely dead. And by the age of 30 he was completely dead. And yet, in that period of his life, he wrote most of his greatest works of music. Pretty much all the famous pieces that have become so famous, used in car adverts and even in movies. There was one time when he stood uh, in a concert hall full of people and he was conducting a whole symphony. And as the symphony reached a crescendo, all the audience, they stood up and gave him a standing ovation. All the people stood up, clapping their hands and they just kept on clapping and clapping, they just wouldn't stop. Looking at the audience response, even the musicians, they were so overwhelmed, they had to stop playing the musical instruments. And here was Beethoven urging them to continue playing. But yet he didn't know what was going on behind his back. He didn't know what was going on because he could not hear. Isn't that incredible that someone can write their best music even without having the ability to hear? How can one do that? You also must have heard of Fanny J. Crosby. You all must have all must be familiar with Fanny Jane Crosby. Most of the hymns that we find in our church hymnals are written by Fanny Jane Crosby. But as we all know, Crosby turned blind shortly after birth. She turned blind shortly after birth. Yet she went on to write so many hymns found 
in hymnals of so many different denominations. Sometimes she even wrote, under pseudonyms, different names, because she thought it would be good if a, book, a hymn book contained so many hymns with the same name. It makes us wonder, isn't it? Even in the face of adversity, what makes these people carry on? What makes these people excel? Even they faced such de degrading circumstances, but yet their music, their hymns, they are an inspiration to all of us from, for so many generations. It says something about us as human, human beings, isn't it? It says something about us that we are more than just our five senses. There are things about the mind that can perceive and conceive things that are beyond just smell or touch or hearing. Sometimes in life, as humans, we stifle ourselves, isn't it? In trying to protect our way of life or out of fear of losing what we think is valuable or precious to us, we try to keep our things safe. We are cautious and doing that we see what we want to see. We want we hear what we want to hear. Today I want to draw your attention to a passage uh, found in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 6. This passage is a very interesting story. Uh, shall we all turn uh, to 2 Kings, chapter 6. Second, we'll be reading from verses 8 to 10. Uh, verses, we'll be reading from verses 8. Can someone kindly read 2 Kings verse 8? Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place <coughs> shall be my hand. Verse 9, yes, yes. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou hast not such a place, for hither the Syrians are come down. Ten, please. Ten. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him, and warned him off, and saved himself there, not once, not twice. Eleven. Therefore the heart of the... Uh, I think... Uh... <coughs> We look at till verse 10. Uh, now we can see uh, in the story. We we, must, we all must be familiar with the story. We see we see the king of Syria has been waging war against Israel, uh, and the king tells his army to set up camp in a particular location so that. They can wait in ambush, thinking that when the Israelites pass that way, they can launch a surprise attack. But then we see that Elijah, the prophet, man of God, he sends, sends a message to the king of Israel, warning him not to go that way, not to go to that place, because the Syrians are waiting for them to ambush them. They should go another way and are saved. And in verse 10 he says, this happened not once or twice, but every time, every time the Syrians make a plan to attack, the Israelites seem to get away. Despite the superior firepower of the Syrian army, the Israelites always kept on winning. They kept on winning because they seemed to know 
what is going to happen before it happens. What is going to happen even before it happens. And this would have obviously troubled the king of Syria, isn't it? Can someone read verse 11? Yeah, the other king is obviously puzzled. All the plans that he makes, the Israelites seem to know well in advance. So he thinks there is a spy among them. There is a spy among them. He summons all his officers, summons all his servants, and he asks the question tell me, which of us is on the side? of the king of Israel. In verse 12, he gets a surprising reply. Can someone read verse 12? And one of the servants said, None of my lord, O king, that the light of the prophet that is in Israel, tell the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in my bedchamber. The servants knew it. There was no spy amongst them. They knew about the prophet, prophet Elisha. They knew that Israel served a God who revealed everything to them. They serve a God who sees everything, hears everything, who knows everything, and who is aware of everything. Let me take a pause here. Have you ever looked at your life and sometimes wonder, you know, in moments of despair, you might think, what's going on with my life? Does anyone care? God, are you seeing what I'm going through? Sometimes in moments of despair, loneliness, you might ask yourself, does anybody know what is going on? Does anyone care? Humanly speaking, maybe nobody knows. Everybody has their own worries, isn't it? Maybe big, small. For example, we come to church every week. We are sat there. Sometimes we are sat there in body, but the mind is somewhere else, preoccupied with. The worries, the burdens of his life. We sat there, date, look on our face. It happens. It happens to me all the time. I could be sat over there and go a whole, a whole sermon without actually listening. Things occupy a mind, trouble a mind. What do you think are some of the testing times? that uh, we may face as humans. Very quickly, can you name me some situations like this? Adversity or uh, testing times. Can anyone name some of the testing times we may face in our lives? Health. Sorry? Health. Health. Health issues. Obviously, right up there, isn't it? Yeah. Loss of health. We studied that in our lesson. Uh, now these days, uh, especially after turning maybe 40, and these days, every little bump that appears on the body, you know, Google it. <laughs> and Google it. Is it cancer? Or you get dizzy standing in the queue in Asia. Google it, it's diabetes. You know, we are so worried about the health. Health is obviously an issue. Health, our own health, our children's health, our parents' health. That's every time our minds back home and thinking of parents and growing old. So health is
Because uh, sometimes does uh, face uh, we face difficult times. Uh, any other problems that we may face? Job. Job. <laughs> Job. Obviously, that job is higher. Well, what would you put higher than? You? Yeah. Sometimes we uh, give priority to our job at the expense of our health. Isn't it? And job is always there. Not we don't need, even need to have high paying jobs as long as we can uh, meet our expenses, put food on the table, take care of our families, take care of what we what is dear to us, isn't it? Uh, and sometimes we are of course with situations, loss of job uh, poses a problem. Uh, you can feel it. Feel it in uh, uh, losing the job. Uh, what about relationships? We studied about uh, loss of relationships in our lesson. Uh, husband and wife purposely, purposely in a tug of war to get uh, get things uh, their own way. Estranged relationships between parents and children. Uh, parents seeing things, parents seeing things their way. Children seeing things their way, and they both see the relationship uh, relationships slipping away. Is it? What about uh, relationships at church? Friend among relationship, amongst fellow believers, friends. Not being able to... Uh, some we just can't get along. Why? Why? Sometimes we just can't get along. But not being able to look a person in the eye. Why? What? Why, why do we have problems like that? Is it we, we, these are some of the burdens too difficult to bear, isn't it? They wear us down. They wear us down. We plan our lives so meticulously, isn't it? We are so careful to protect our interests. We take all the necessary precautions, smooth on all the edges, edges. We want to be ready for all eventual eventualities, isn't it? And then out of the blue, bam, out of nowhere, like a sucker punch, we are hit. We find ourselves flat on the ground. Sometimes circumstances in our life, we find ourselves in a hole, isn't it? We find ourselves in a hole. Take the example of Joseph. He literally found himself in a hole, isn't it? From a very young age, he was brought up to be special. He was taught scriptures. He was destined to be a great man. He had special visions in which he saw his destiny. He even had a special multicolored coat. And here, yet, where does he find himself? He finds himself in a hole in Dothan. And it seems as if Joseph makes it a habit of finding himself in a hole. No sooner he is out of one hole, he finds himself in another hole in Potiphar's prison. How do these people manage facing adversity? How do these people find their way back? How do these people find their way to find it in themselves to get up again? What about Daniel? He found himself in captivity and he found himself in a hole face to face with hungry lions. Yet he came out the better for it. Last week we were studying in a 
less than the sum of real life problems <laughs> faced by single single parent families, parents without children, real life problems. Even today we study about loss, losing family members, losing uh, relationships, losing even trust in God. Sometimes we feel so overwhelmed by our problems, isn't it? Life becomes so unbearable. We try to wrestle with our problems. We can't sleep at night, twisting and turning in bed. Sometimes I can stay hours in bed without sleeping. Uh, especially when you turn the switch off at night. And then the quietness and the darkness, our mind goes in overdrive. You want to sleep, close your eyes. And our mind starts working, isn't it? In the darkness and the stillness of the night, our problems take on gigantic proportions. And in our despair, we cry out, God, what's going on? Can you see what's going on with my life? Sure, God sees. God sees. Just not how we see things. We see things around, in our own perspective. We seek solutions to our problems as we see it. And we expect tangible solutions to our problems, isn't it? That is because we don't see as God sees. Throughout the history of the uh, children of Israel in operation and then being delivered, God was with, always with them, with the children of Israel. God was with, always with his children. In Exodus 3 7, it is said, Indeed, God says, Indeed, I have seen the misery of my people. I have heard, I have heard their cry. In a bustling crowd, Jesus feels a woman touching him. He feels a woman touching him. And he feels it. Jesus knows. He knows what the woman wants. He feels that she is looking for healing. Last week we studied about Hannah. We studied about Hannah. Her name means favor or grace. But it would seem that Hannah did not find favor with God because she couldn't bear a child. So distraught, she barely whispers a prayer to God. And you know what? God hears her prayer. And God gives her, her a son. And she names him Samuel. That means God hears. Yes, friends. We serve a God who sees. We serve a God who hears. Who knows. Who is aware. It should also cause sobering reflection that he hears all those private conversations you have in your bedrooms, even in your bedrooms. He hears the murmuring of your heart. He knows your words before you even speak them and your thoughts before you even think them. You see, God answers his people's needs through helping them see differently. To see better, to see things as he sees them. Let's go back to the story and see what maybe God is trying to show us today. Uh, let's read from uh, verse 13, continue reading from verse 13. Someone can read. Second Kings chapter 6, verse 13 on 13 and 14. And he said, Go and spy where he is. I may set him and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Because he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he hither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and kept past the city above. And when the servants of the man of God was 
Okay, uh, for now we look at verse 13 and 14. So we see here the king sends his army to get hold of prophet. After he finds out that Elisha is helping the uh, children of Israel, the king, uh, he doesn't think that God is going to re reveal to Elisha that they are coming for him. But he just sends his entire army just to get hold of one man uh, and their uh, Syrian army surrounds the city uh, city of Doth and where Elisha is <coughs> the story gets more interesting here uh, can someone read, uh, read uh, verse 15 when the servant of man of God was visiting Alas, my master, oh no, my lord, what shall we do? That is the servant, can you can imagine? The servant waking up early in the morning, he opens the window and what does he see? What is the sight he sees? He sees a massive <coughs> entire army, Syrian army, surrounding his house, surrounding the city. And he responds and he said, My Lord, what shall we do? We are going to be captured, we are going to be killed. They have come to kill us. What is uh, Elisha's response to the servant's cry? Verse 16. And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that you Fear not. Those that are with us are more than those who are with them. Those that are with us are more than those who are with them. What do you understand from this word? I mean, the servant, he could see, he could see the armies surrounding the city. But here Elisha is telling, don't worry, we have more people on our side than the army. Someone he could see, physically he could see, but he could not see the actual truth. We do not know if Elisha actually saw soldiers or the God's army surrounding the Syrian army, but we know that he knew God was there. He knew that God is more powerful than any armies of this world. Verse 17. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. O oh Lord, open his eyes that he may see. Because we know the servant can physically see. We know that he doesn't have a physical disability in mind. But you know, as you and I know, what he is speaking of is the inability of the servant to have spiritual eyes. That is without minimizing the battle before the Israelites and in fact his own predicament Elisha was realizing that the real battle was in fact a spiritual one for his servant was seen but was not seen we are often like the servant of Elisha who have the physic physical ability to see what we may have the physical ability to see but not the spiritual reality right around us very clearly all the servant was able to see was the enemies surrounding them the size of the enemies against them and their smallness or at least their relative smallness
This is what we speak of in scripture as spiritual blindness while having the ability to see, not fully see the reality as God sees it. You must have heard this verse or <coughs> sentence. If God is for us, who can be against us? You must have heard. Or, for to me is Christ and to die is gain. Can anyone tell me who said these words? Paul, yes, of course, it's Paul. Paul says these words. But Paul says these words only after he's had the encounter with God on the road to Damascus, where he was struck blind. As we know, in the encounter, when Paul is struck blind, as he falls down, he becomes blind. His eyes are open, but yet he could not see. And, and you know, God had to put, literally put scales on his eyes and then remove them so that he could see the reality. This is the symbolic, this is symbolic of the nature of many of us who are living in sin. That in sin we do not see reality as it ought to be seen. We do not understand what is happening around us despite the fact we have the physical ability to see. If God be for us, who can be against us? This is what Elisha is teaching us as his servant is opening his eyes. In verse 16, it reminds us what Elisha saw when he said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are against us. The conclusion to the prayer and the answer to the prayer was simply this. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And he beheld the mountains were full of horses and chariots full of fire around Elisha. All that the servant was able to see was the physical enemy that confronted them and concluded that his life was at an end. What Elisha saw, and now through his prayer, his servant saw, was that God was surrounding even the enemy. That indeed, he is even bigger and more powerful than the enemy. This was the experience of the children of Israel again and again that God is with them. It was the ultimate lesson in life that whatever is happening in the field, the battle that is truly being waged is a spiritual one. And the battle that is won is not victorious power or some kind of unction on our part. Ultimately, the battle was won purely because of the might and power of God. Oftentimes it is easy to forget this. You know, as children we used to say, sing children's song, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty. Yet, when our problems, we are faced with problems, our problems become more bigger. We even sometimes bigger, appear bigger than our God. We uh, used to sing the song, Jesus loves me this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak but very strong. For us it is uh, too, little, too little for us to believe. Maybe this song is for little children. And we have come to understand that in this world, this life must be one. 
with our own hand and ingenuity. How else can we explain how we handle, handle ourselves on a daily basis? But yet, this is not what the scripture reminds us. At the end of the day, we should be able to see that we follow mighty God. Friends, do you see in your life the Lord battle on your behalf? Do you see the way He reminds us on a daily basis that we are ever <coughs> dependent on Him? But that is just the first, first blindness. There is another blindness problem in this uh, story. We find a surprising ending to this story. In verse 18, can someone read in verse 18? And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. So here we see another kind of blindness. We see Elisha asking God, please try the Syrian soldiers with blindness. That's an interesting request, isn't it? This pe these people can see, but Elisha is asking God to turn them blind. But we know this is not a physical blindness. They can see because they are led by Elisha to Samaria where the Israelites are waiting for them. This is not a physical blindness, but this is confusion and lack of comprehension associated with spiritual blindness. They can see, but don't actually see. They have the ability to see, but not the ability to understand. Then verse 20, after they had entered the city, Elijah said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so that they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. So we see here Elisha requesting or praying to God. The same prayer that he offered for a servant, he made the same prayer on behalf of these Samarian soldiers. Lord open their eyes that they may see. When the king of Israel saw that, you know, he must have uh, been excited. God has delivered uh, the enemy into our hand. And he says, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? In verse 22, we see that Elisha says, do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill those who have, you have captured with your own food? or bow. Instead, set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to the master. So he prepared a great feast for them and after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to the master. After that, so the bands from Syria Aram stopped raiding Israel territory. You'd fully expect the children of Israel, children of uh, Israel, the king, you know, if the enemy is delivered to you, you'd expect them to destroy them. Uh, but then Elisha says, don't kill them, but make a feast for them. Doesn't make sense, does it? If the tables were turned, if the Syrians had won, they would not have given second thoughts in killing the people of God. But instead, the Syrians were given a feast. It was an unexpected grace and mercy. Someone 
is the grace and mercy sometimes are defined as grace deals with others in a way that they do not deserve. Grace deals with us and others in a way that they do not deserve. And mercy refrains from dealing with others in a way they deserve. If you get my point. Here is a picture of God who is merciful. He is a merciful God. The Syrians were enemies of God. Yet instruct destruction and death, God provided them in life, provided them in salvation and abundance, great feet prepared for them. It is easy for us to forget that you and I were once enemy, enemies of God. In Ephesians 2:2 uh, 2, 2 it says. Wherein, in time past, he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. <coughs> we walked, we were sinners, we walked according to the ways of this world. But yet, in verse 4 and 5, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. God who is rich in mercy, he loves us. Even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. This is the gospel foretold and experienced in the Old Testament. Those who deserve destruction given life in abundance. In order that we understand the abundance given to Syrians, so that through it you and I, who are believers of our God in heaven, who in Christ showed us this surprising ending to us, that we may better comprehend this overflowing abundance. We may not see it, we may not understand it, but all that we have in our lives are really at the merciful hand of God. And God wants us to know that God is always there for us. Even in the moments of valley and shadow of death. Friends, do you see it? Do you see it in your life? Is the Lord at work in your life? in your heart, your minds, in your relationships, in your families, in your church. Do you see it? Do you see God's hand at work? In closing, according to Sinclair Ferguson, true discernment is not only distinguishing the right from the wrong, the primary from the secondary, the essential from the indifferent and the permanent from the transient. It means distinguishing the good from the better and better from the best. Discernment is a subset of wisdom. So discernment is learning to think God's thoughts for us. Learning to know the will of God for us, practically and spiritually. It means having a sense of how things look in God, God's eyes and seeing them in some measure uncovered. It means seeing through God's eyes as God sees. My friends, in life we may be faced with difficult situations. But as we have learned, God is always there for us. In time of adversity, God is there, He's promised to be there with us. 
God is the God who hears. God is the God who sees. He understands. He understands and we cry for help. My friends, may the Lord give us eyes to see, ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts to receive. This is my prayer for you today. Dear Lord and Lord Father, yes, dear Father, we are waiting for the promised land. We are waiting for your soon return. We are waiting for the end of tribulation. We are waiting for the end of suffering. <coughs> Help us to see, dear Father. Help us to hear. Help us to know that you are our God. And until that day, dear Father, keep us. Which is never free. Mm -hmm.